Let us pray. O oh God, may the words in my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this morning. Amen. In her book, The Great Emergence, historical theologian Phyllis Tickle studies the shifts in westernized Christianity that have taken place every 500 years or so. Each of these shifts that have taken place lead to a re-examining of the one question, wherein now does our authority lie? At that time, the church has, as Tickle states, held an ecclesiastical garage sale where that which no longer serves the church is discarded. Now she and others consider us to be in one of those times where the shifts in Christianity are being reshaped through engagement with this one question about where we find our authority. It seems we're in good company with Jesus. Today's gospel story takes place just after the cleansing of the temple and the cursing of the fig tree. Both stories where the traditional authority of the religious folks in charge is being questioned. Opening the door to a dialogue that includes new new beginnings, new focus. The authorities, of course, react in a way that any religious authority, including myself, would react given the circumstances by challenging the question and the questioner. Both Jesus and his challengers, they understand that God is the ultimate authority. The question though that's posed has to do more with the validity of how that authority is interpreted to address and affect the people whom God has created. So the chief priest's first question to Jesus is, by what authority are you doing these things? reasonable enough. Their authority in Israel, after all, had been given to them in the time of Moses by God. Jesus' question of them comes as a challenge to this traditionally held authority. That's where the dialogue gets really interesting between Jesus and the chief priests and elders following typical rabbinical style. Questions met with questions. It presents a conundrum for the chief priests and the elders who did not recognize John the Baptist and for whom a yes or a no answer would have serious consequences. They are being challenged by an obviously unanswerable question to confront the fact that they have refused to recognize the messages and the people that have been sent by God. If they were anything like me, they were probably thinking to themselves, geez, I hate rhetorical questions. <laughs> Refusing to answer because they are wise enough to realize this is a catch-22 situation, Jesus then tells a parable of two sons to hammer home his point. Two sons are asked to go to work by their father. The first one says no, but ends up going. The second one says, yes, sure dad, I'll go, but doesn't actually end up going. The leaders, according to Jesus in this story, are like that second son. And they're smart enough to figure that out. 
that this story also undermines their authority and announces the establishment of a new order where the chief priest and the elders will be put aside because they've lost touch with God and with the people, while those who have been traditionally considered outsiders, the prostitutes and tax collectors, are now the very ones who are speaking and living God's truth. Well, we are living in the same dialogue right now. We are in a time when within our churches and across much of the Christian world, we're being challenged with the question of what's our authority. Now this is not a question of denominational structure or even lo local church structures, but a question of where we can best hear of, be embraced by, be liberated with, and be responsible to the God who created, who redeemed, and who sanctified us. This passage challenges us as individuals and as communities of faith to figure out what is our authority. What is the authority for our faith and how then do we live it out? Well, Shane Hips in his excellent book, Selling Water by the River, has a wonderful quote that I think captures some of what is going on in this passage and also currently within the Christian church. Some, in an effort to protect and preserve the gospel message, have become like the guards in a museum. Fueled by fear that its treasures could be damaged or stolen if they are not vigilant in their watch. They've mistaken the good news for an ancient artifact that needs to be protected, but that's not its nature. The good news is more like a tree, and God is looking for gardeners, not guards. A guard is trained in a defensive stance of fear and suspicion, a gardener on the other hand, is motiva motivated by love and creativity. Well, today's scripture is challenging us to consider the ways that we act as the second son. After all, these years we may be the ones who are confronted daily by fresh and sometimes strange voices who are calling for a kind of faithfulness that seems foreign to us. All around us we can hear the voice of Jesus in a strange cadence that perks up our ears while at the same time causing us some discomfort. And we want to be faithful to God's new call, but sometimes, unfortunately, more often than not, we might wind up as guards in a museum protecting a treasure. But there is also the possibility that we as the followers in the way of Jesus and as members of the church might wind up like that first son, resisting the voice of change at first and refusing to follow, but then eventually working as master gardeners in an ever-growing garden if we are willing to see with fresh eyes and changed hearts, we can be faithful to God revealed to us in Jesus. We are challenged to follow a person who regularly confronted calcified authorities in order to bring about new birth and new life. Given the age of Christianity and its identification with so much a society in the Western world, we must take care not to become the current chief priests and elders, worrying more about guarding what we have, holding this ancient treasure instead of being gardeners 
growing both heirloom plants and hybrids and adapting as the garden grows. Just imagine, envision the beauty of that garden that we can create with God. Amen.